Welcome to the 23rd episode of the series Decolonizing the Mind. Today is the 1st of January and normally we would extend our greetings for Happy New Year, but we live in horrible times and uh, it's so hard to utter these words, Happy New Year, while there's a genocide going on uh, in Palestine and our hearts are with all the victims there. Um, but we'll move on with our educational series, uh, no matter what. Um, today, uh, we continue our discussion on the uh, narrative of civilizations. And uh, this episode deals with the narratives in Latin Abyayala, formerly known as Latin America. <clears throat> but let me reflect on 2024, what we can expect in this coming year. In my view, this is a decisive year in world history. I guess the war in Ukraine will end with the victory of Russia, <clears throat> the final defeat of Ukraine and the final defeat basically of uh, NATO and American uh, imperialism. Palestine will enter a decisive phase in its history. Uh, the genocide will come to an end, but how and at what cost? Um, we'll, we'll discuss it in a minute later. Uh, and then there's the looming conflict in uh, Southeast Asia where the USA tries to stir up um, problems there. So a confrontation with China, North Korea, and the US and its proxies is possible in coming year, in this year. <clears throat> where do we stand in Palestine? 20,000 people, 22,000 people has been killed, 57,000 wounded. The Houthis in Yemen have imposed a naval blockade for ships going to Israel. And it's very effective and it caused a lot of problems for Israel, economic loss. Uh, <clears throat> and it might uh, be the next step in a uh, regional war. In the north, uh, the second front for Israel, with Lebanon and Hezbollah, is going on for a few weeks. Uh, almost a quarter million of settlers have been evacuated from northern Israel, which is for the first time since 1948. Uh, so there's a real uh, problem for Israel in the north. And despite all talks of ceasefire agreements, there's nothing. And Hamas made it clear that unless there is a total cessation of uh, Israelis uh, hostilities, there will not be no ceasefire. And on the other hand, <clears throat> Netanyahu's conditions for peace, uh, he laid it out in an op-ed, uh, I think the New York Times, where he basically says this is a matter of life and death. And we have conditions for peace, three conditions to complete destruction of Hamas, the demilitarization of the Gaza Strip and the de-radicalization of the Palestinian population in Gaza. These are complete idiotic uh, fantasies of Netanyahu. And if he lives in that fantasy world, it means there will be no peace and this war will end in something else than a peace agreement. Looking at the bigger picture, I leave Ukraine, just look at what's happening in Africa, where uh, a few months ago in July 26, there was a coup d'etat in Niger, and four days later, the economic community of West African states, under pressure of France, issued an ultimatum saying that they will invade Niger if they don't uh, roll back the coup. France said, our embassy will stay there, our army will stay there, no matter what. And look, just a half year later, December 5th, uh, Niger had revoked its security agreements with the US, turned to Russia for defense partnership, 
and a few weeks later, in December 22, France completely withdraws its military from Nigeria and formally closes its embassy. Who would think that in July 30, that would be the outcome of all the sable rattling that was going on uh, in France and in Africa? <clears throat> so let's go back to the narrative of civilization. And I've dealt with Russia, China, India. Um, I'm now with Latin Abyayala. Abyayala is the term that indigenous people use for the Americas. And to understand the progressive movement in Latin Abyayala, you have to understand the big influence of the Cuban revolution and liberation movements. And uh, so Marxism has been a very strong influence in Latin Abyayala, and yet also decolonial theory is strong in Latin Abyayala. So these are two movements that come together. Uh, I'll do a special series in the future on Marxism and decoloniality, uh, but for now, I will focus on the other narratives which are coming up in Latin Abyayala and goes back to the old uh, pre-Columbian uh, civilizations, the Aztec in central Abyayala, Mexico, the Mayas, also in Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, the Incas in Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia. And <clears throat> you might think that the Holocaust, uh, that the Spanish cost wiped out everything, every civilization. And that's, to a large extent, that is true. There is an estimate that the population in Latin Abyayala might be somewhere between 75 and 145 million. And one scholar, Stannard, describes the, the Holocaust that took place. He said, within no more than a handful of generations, following the first <clears throat> encounters with Europeans, the vast majority of the Western Hemisphere native people had been exterminated. The pace and magnitude of the obliteration varied Farayat from place to place and from time to time, but for years now, historical demographers uh, have been uncovering in region upon region post Columbian depopulation rates of between 90 and 98 percent with such regularity that an overall decline of 95 percent has become a working rule of thumb. What this means is that, on average, for every 20 natives alive at the moment of European contact, when the lands of the Americas teemed with numerous tens of millions of people only want to in the place when the bloodbath was over. How is it possible that in our history, in our world history, in the history of the class, these basic facts are just uh, left out? Now, the genocide indeed literally eradicated the urgent population in many places, but there are a few countries where the indigenous population are still a sizable part of the population. In Peru, 45% of the population has indigenous roots. In Bolivia, 44%, Guatemala, 41%, Mexico, 28%, and even to a lesser extent, Belize, 70%, Ecuador, 40%, and Panama, 12%. So we have pockets of communities that uh, goes back to these old civilizations. And when we look at what these civilizations can contribute to a new world civilization that we strive to build after the decline of the colonial world civilization, I find particularly interesting the story of Kwao Hetumok, one who has descended like an eagle is the meaning of his name. This was a young Aztec ruler of Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, who gave a speech on the occasion of the last battle in a struggle to prevent the establishment of colonial rule in Mexico. That was on August the 12th, 1521. The day after the speech, he was captured by Hernan Cortes, the Spanish barbarian who led the invasion of Aztec land. He was held captive for three and a half years before being executed upon the orders of Cortes. While Tumac was tortured by bathing his hands and feet in cooking oil, the next day was hanged. So this is this barbarian act of 
ultimate torture by putting hands and feet in cooking oil. Horrible. Now, um, in his speech, Guru Tumak said, Our son is now hidden from few. The face of our son has disappeared and has left us in complete darkness. But we know it will return again, that it will rise again and it will begin to illuminate us anew. While our son is away and remains in the residence of silence, we must safely join together and, and embrace. And in the very center of our being, we must hide all that our hearts love and hide all we know uh, is a great as a great treasure. We will destroy our creative centers, our schools, our ball courts, our youth centers, our places of song and diversion. Let happen let, until our desolate streets remain and we will only find comfort within our homes. This will be until that time when our new sun rises. Dearest fathers and mothers, you must never forget to show young people the way to teach your children, make your children understand that while they live it, uh, they live, it is evidence of how good to us our dearest Mother Earth, Anahua, has been. We have the shelter and protection of our destiny, expressed through great respect and positive behavior, and confirmed by those who have come before us. We keep them in mind because our parents enthusiastically cultivated this within our spirit. Then it will be the time for our children to assume their responsibility. Don't forget to keep our children informed. Remind them of how wonderful it will be, how we will rise again and understand the reach of our power. And at that time, we, we our Mother Earth and Hawak, will realize her great destiny. Now, <clears throat> the historical origin of the speech is disputed. Uh, uh, the speech is said to be created by a group called Movimiento de la Mexicanidad in the 20th century. Uh, and it took Quahatumak as the icon to create awareness of colonization in Mexico. It brought together the elements of indigenous knowledge that contains uh, the essential concept in the speech. Well, that's matter. Whether the speech is accurately in historical sense doesn't matter. It matters how people remember and recreate the speech and use this as a guideline of how to build a new future and how to look at colonialism. And for us, from DTM perspective, decolonizing the mind perspective, it's interesting to compare the concept of an era of darkness that the barbaric invasion has brought upon the people of Koyatumak to his to the idea of enlightenment. Koyatumak says, the face of our sun has disappeared and has left us in complete darkness. And this is a sharp contrast diction to the few of the colonizer who would present the era of colonialism as the era of progress that was codified in the 17th century in terms like enlightenment and modernity. What the colonizer regards it as enlightenment was in the experience of the colonizing era of darkness filled with genocide, theft, murder, rape, oppression, exploitation. What in academic decolonial theory became known as the other side of modernity he was already articulated in this speech 500 years ago. Now, <clears throat> the other interesting thing about the speech of Kuala Duma, he says, he calls upon his people to hide all that our hearts love and hide all we know as a great treasure. And he continues, we will destroy our creative centers, our schools, etc., which I just quoted. And by doing that, he denies the occupier the opportunity of taking over their centers of knowledge. And he says, quite to me, the culture and knowledge should thrive outside the world of the colonizers. When he says, uh, dearest fathers and mothers, you must never forget, that, forget to show young people the way to teach your children. And in decolonial theory, in DTM, we revisit the knowledge of non-Western civilizations and colonialism, which has tried to raise that knowledge, will be criticized. And because colonialism have never succeeded in erasing those civilizations, we can still use basic concept of it. And the idea of Kohatuma 
of a new sun that will arise is basically where we get this concept of a new world civilization. This is the core of DTM. And we argue in this our book with fact, theory, and analysis that colonialism was not the senior, not the top, but the, the, the near, the the dear, the lowest point of human civilization. And in order to rise again from the bottom, mankind needs to take a critical look of how knowledge production, seeking the truth, was transforming ideology, which is producing lies, and has a daunting task of creating new foundations of scientific knowledge. And that's the challenge for decolonial theory for the coming centuries. Now, this was the Aztec legacy. Let's look at the Maya legacy. In Mexico, the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, SLN, made the link between socialism and the Abyayala civilization. Its spokesman, its uh, spokesman, uh, Comandante, Supermandante Marcos, explains the confrontation between Marxism, Leninism, and the ancient Maya philosophy in the communities of the southern state of Chiapas in Mexico. He says, so when the Zapatistas went into those communities, he says, in this exchange between two different forms of decision making, the most orthodox proposals of Marxism or Leninism, theoretical concept of historical references, for example, that the vanguard of the revolution is the proletariat, that the taking of state power and the installation of the dictatorship of the proletariat is the aim of the revolution, these, these ideas were confronted by an ideological tradition that is how can I say it? Somewhat magical, says Subcommandante Marcus. He says, <clears throat> it is magical in one sense, but very real in another. What I mean by this is that it is an ideological tradition born of war. In this case, the war of conquest that began well, not exactly 500 years ago, and that continues through different historical periods. It continues, it continues, and it grows. If we had been orthodox leftists, we would ne never have been have worked with native peoples. Now today, I believe that there are many theories in crisis, and basically says Marxism is in crisis. We who would have thought that it would be the native peoples who would, would provoke all this? Not even in the Leninist concept of the weakest links was a thought that it might be the native people, right? And he continues. I told you that there was a learning process at the beginning of our work, albeit a false one. So when the Zapatistas went into those communities, you know, they started to work with them. And he says, it's not like we said, well, we are going to learn and see what happens. No, we were close minded like any other orthodox leftist, like any other theoretician who believes that he knows the truth. Ultimately, the theoretical confronted the practical and something happens. The result was the Zapatistas. Therefore, our combatants are right when they say, we are not Marxist Leninists, we are Zapatistas. They are referring to the synthesis, this coming together, this compatibility that incorporates, I'm going to be very schematic, the historical traditions of struggle and resistance of uh, native people and the necessity of a national revolution. So this is the Maya legacy in, also in Mexico, uh, where we have the Aztec legacy, and then we get the Inca legacy in Bolivia. In 2005, Evo Morales was chosen in the general election as the first native president. And his party, the Movimiento al Socialismo, Movement for Socialism, was massively supported by the native communities. Mind you, so the party is, names itself as a socialist party. See? And yet, like in Mexico, it combines socialism and socialist narrative with uh, indigenous narrative. When it came to power, you know, uh, they uh, issued uh, a new uh, constitution that was voted uh, for in 2009, and the preamble of the constitutions opens with a statement that acknowledges the ancient civilizations of its people. In ancient times, the preamble says, <clears throat> mountains arose, rivers moved, and lakes were, were formed. Our Amazonia, our swamps, our highlands, and our plains and valleys were covered with greenery and flowers. 
You populated the sacred Mother Earth with different phases. And since that time, you have understood the plurality that exists in all things and in our diversity as human beings and cultures. Thus, our people were formed and we never knew racism until we were subjected to it during the terrible times of colonialism. We have left the colonial, republican and neoliberal state in the past. And Article 9 of the Constitution defines the function of the state and one of the function is to construct a just and harmonious society built on decolonization without discrimination or exploitation but through social justice in order to strengthen the plurinational identities. And in the section on education, Article 78 outlines the purpose of higher education. Education is unitary, public, universal, democratic, participatory, communitarian, decolonizing, and of quality. So you see that the concept of decolonization uh, has been embedded in the constitution of Bolivia and in the goal of uh, the Socialist Party of Bolivia. It's very interesting to see the merger of socialism with uh, decolonial officials. And also in the uh, Inca concept, uh, this idea of the sun will rise again is embedded in the notion of Pachacuti. In December 21, 2012, the government of Bolivia organized an event to commemorate the beginning of the Pachacuti. According to old Mayan legends, a dark period known as the Macha or No Time began when Columbus set foot on the land. Now, the time has arrived for a new era, the Pachacuti, which will slowly el el eliminate hunger, disease, and wars and bring about harmony between humankind and nature. And Eva Morales explained the significance of Pachacuti. He says, this 21st of December is the day of the initiation of the Pachacuti, which translates into the awakening of the world to the culture of life. So, and he, he continues, he says, it is the beginning of the end of unfettered capitalism, as well as a transition from the time of violence between human beings and violence to nature the new time in which human beings will constitute a unity with Mother Earth and all will live in harmony and equilibrium with the cosmos as a whole. This day is for the age-old societies the moment when major telluric cosmos changes will occur in the planet and the omen that the culture of death, hunger and injustice will have reached its end. It means the end of a state of things and the beginning of profound changes of the world. So this idea, you know, that uh, we will have a new era, a new sun will arise. Uh, this idea is very strongly embedded in the narratives in Latin America. And you'll see it also in Islam and, you know, in, in other uh, 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 philosophies, uh, the idea that it is possible to create a new and better world. And Morales says of the current civilization, uh, he says, capitalism has created a civilization that is wasteful, consumerist, exclusive, clientelist, and a generator of opulence and misery. That's the pattern of life, production, and consumption that we urgently need to transform. And he says, our main task ahead is to destroy imperialism and build the civilized, civilizing horizon of living well in harmony and equilibrium with Mother Earth. And this concept of living well in Spanish is Buen Fifir or Fifir Bien, in Quechua is Suma Causa, is a crucial concept in the indigenous cosmology and is even uh, included in the constitution of Bolivia. <clears throat> in uh, 2021, the vice president of Bolivia, the, uh, David Shokohuanca, uh, defines Buen Fifir as follows. He says, Fifir Bien is to recover the experience of our people, restore the culture of life, and reclaim our lives in complete harmony and mutual respect with Mother Nature, with the Pachamama, where everything is life, where we are always uh, the children of nature and cosmos. Uh, we are all part of nature, and there's nothing 
that of a state of things and the beginning of a profound uh, uh, changes in the world. So the ancient civilizations of Yala, of Yala were destroyed to a large extent, but not completely. And there are still concepts in this indigenous movement that we can use to build a new world civilization. In the next episode, I'll go into the complex African narratives about a new and better world, uh, looking at Africa, Asia, Caribbean, and Brazil, uh, so the African diaspora and the African continent. <clears throat> you could look in the index of the book for more details about these narratives. Uh, you could download, obviously, the PDF of this presentation from sandohira.com. And if you want to support this channel, subscribe to it, like it, share it with friends, family, and colleagues, and encourage them to subscribe, get involved in the discussion group, and if you want to make a donation, uh, go to sandohira.com to see how you can do that. Thank you for your attention and hope uh, to see you next week.